Hello and welcome to Showcase, TR2 World's flagship arts and culture show coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. On this episode, we explore the nature-inspired works of Turkish artist Osman Dinç, show you how young African artists are taking their designs to the international market and flip through the pages of what some say is one of the greatest comic books ever written. But first, to the mean streets of Hong Kong. Local color, how these murals are brightening up this busy East Asian metropolis. Art Basel returns to Hong Kong, putting the spotlight on Asia's booming international art scene. And crafting messages using an ancient art, we'll watch Taiwan's presidential calligraphers at work. The sixth edition of Art Basel has opened in Hong Kong this week. Close to 250 galleries representing more than 30 countries and territories are staging exhibits, from new work by high-profile artists to masterpieces by the likes of Picasso and Liechtenstein. A public with a growing appetite for art is sure to be satisfied. TR2 World's Joel Flynn finds out what's on offer. When it comes to contemporary pop art, few might claim to capture the zeitgeist quite as earnestly as Jeff Koons. But does the American's riveting reproduction of banality in things as everyday as balloons mean he could now be considered a pillar of the art establishment? That's a question being posed to audiences in Hong Kong at this year's Art Basel. His swan inflatable takes center stage at the David Zwerner booth. The Mega Dealer is just one of 248 galleries exhibiting here this year, but is part of a growing group of Western exhibitors. Some say that's a sign the fair might be losing touch with its roots. Others argue it's part of a maturing art market in the city. The one thing that's very remarkable about Asian clients is the way um, their taste evolves and I think um, and, and they're always curious, interested to know um, works from not only from within Asia but from other parts of the world. Um, I think also interesting where uh, they're curious about gen different generations perhaps. Sometimes collectors are interested in moving back in time, getting to know um, older um, sort of older material, um, historical material by, 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 one, by Asian masters. Hong Kong's status as a hub for both selling and displaying art has long been prominent in Asia, but it's only since 2008 that the city has had an art fair of this kind at all. At a time when many here are reflecting on questions of identity and politics, it's exhibitors and artists who are saying that it's precisely this sort of fair that offers an almost unparalleled opportunity for expression. For the Encounters exhibit, the theme of that expression this year is form. Toshikatsu Endo's Void Wooden Boat Hong Kong is an 11 meter long vessel carved from wood, then fired and soaked in tar. The key element though is the void itself, a central subject in Endo's work. It's the fourth year Encounters has been curated by Alexi Glass Cantor, who's executive director of Art Space in Sydney. I think art has an incredible role to play in the social, cultural and political space of shaping and expanding the way in which we think about the world we live in and the times we connect to. Primarily, Encounters is filled with living artists and living artists aren't necessarily dealing with the complicated politics of the times in which we find ourselves. The fair's emphasis on Asian art continues this year, providing a platform rarely available elsewhere in the region. 30-year-old Sri Lankan Ramesh Mario Nithyendran with his Mud Men Volume 2 is part of a new, younger generation of artists and galleries from the East. Hong Kong, meanwhile, is strongly represented by 26 galleries exhibiting across the city. Henrietta Tri Lung, owner of Hong Kong-based gallery Aura Aura and co-president of the Hong Kong Art Gallery Association, says there's still more room for growth. 
I think this influx of international galleries definitely affect Hong Kong galleries in a good way because I think um, think about the buzz, the big party that House and Worth threw and all this amazing um, noise and um, that, that is generated because I, I, I always reiterate that I think we need to be clustered together with everyone to, to make an industry. The rising interest in the Hong Kong art scene is hardly surprising. Asia accounts for 23% of global art sales and 15% of private dealer sales, according to a joint report by Art Basel and UBS. While Chinese demand dominates, growing interest from collectors in South Korea, Japan and Southeast Asia is also helping spur growth. But as the Asian presence swells in the halls of the Hong Kong Convention and Exhibition Center, the interest from Hong Kong's public is also bubbling. Last year, the show attracted nearly 80,000 people over five days, 30% more than when it began six years ago. Art Basel has really helped us to build Hong Kong into a cultural hub, uh, bringing a lot of uh, world-class uh, arts exhibitions and galleries. And what is most exciting is audience building. As more and more art industry insiders fly to Hong Kong at the end of March for this fair, Art Basel's claim to be the most important family of art shows anywhere in the world is becoming harder to refute. Joel Flynn, TRT World, Hong Kong. To speak more about Hong Kong's Art Basel, I'm joined by artist Wong Kitty, whose work is on display at the fair. Thank you so much for joining us today. Now, tell me about uh, your works that are on display at the fair and what you hope audiences will take away from them. Um, well, you know, normally collector go to the art fair, you know, they see the work, they like it, they buy it. Um, but uh, for me, I'm more interested in, you know, the, the other kind of relationship between the collector and the artist. Um, so I'm, I'm less interested in just having like a monetary uh, transaction relationship with, with a collector. So my project is about uh, proposing this idea that, you know, instead of selling the work, uh, they can actually lease the work from me for 99 years. Um, I hope that um, the audience can get some surprise out of the project and think mm -hmm. about alternative way of um, the art system. A lot of your body of work explores the concept of space. But how complicated is it to connect to that concept uh, when you're at an atmosphere like an art fair where there's such little space and a lot of competing works? Uh, I was born and raised in Hong Kong, um, it, although now I spend more time in New York. Uh, but growing up with, you know, Hong Kong is known for, you know, having a very tiny uh, apartment. So um, we... I just learned from when I was small that, you know, you just need to be flexible in terms of the space. So for my booth, I actually divide that into three sessions. Um, I have a session for the list slash buy song, and then I have a karaoke lounge, and then I have this DNA sampling station. So all just happen within that like 100 square feet. Um, I think it's fun to, you know, think about that or like, I think it's it's like a good constraint for for us to think about how we should use uh, space more efficiently. Um, yeah, I think that's that's a good challenge. Well, there is a lot of great talent coming out of Hong Kong. I have to say, thank you so much for joining us today on Showcase. It was great having you. Thank you. From murals made famous by social media to battles fought using nothing but paint and brushes, Hong Kong's street art scene has exploded in recent years, and the results can now be seen splashed on alleyways and walls across the city. And it's even begun to attract talent from other countries as well. An English man in Hong Kong. It's mural artist Dan Kitchener's third visit to the southern Chinese city in the past month. And he's been leaving his mark in unexpected corners. Hong Kong's got a very unique character. 
the kind of, uh, especially with the the hills, you know, the steep streets, the little narrow streets, really busy, lots of sort of bustling energy and vibrancy in the markets. Um, I, and I like all the little alleyways and all the kind of, the kind of intricacy of, of the streets. It's kind of very unique. Trained for many years in watercolor and acrylic painting, Kitchener's work mainly features neon lights, reflections, and rain, sights that first captivated him on a visit to Tokyo. Epic scale things was always quite attractive because um, I kind of like um, a lot of drama and scale and a kind of almost theatrical kind of feel to my work. But Kitchener isn't the only artist decorating Hong Kong. And some of them even have their very own audience. In recent years, street art has enjoyed a boost from growing popularity in Asia and an increasing number of galleries featuring street artists. As a result, it now has a higher profile and Hong Kong's practitioners have more commercial spin in the city. Combining an ancient practice with politics, deep inside the corridors of Taiwan's presidential office, calligraphers craft messages on behalf of the island's leaders as they seek to keep the traditional art alive. Let's take a look. She works for the president, but her job doesn't require her to be so formal. Yang Shu Wan is Taiwanese president Tsai Ing-wen's calligrapher. She was selected after applying for the position in 2016 when Tsai came to power. The artist creates everything from small notes to large scrolls, delivering congratulations and condolences to residents. I write the characters so it mirrors her personality. Also, I show her frank and unpretentious side. For example, some characters can be more unpretentious, bringing that out through the script. For some, they will see it and think that's the president. And Susan Huang is the personal scribe of Vice President Chen Jiang Zhan. She believes one of the most important parts of the art is to carry the emotion onto paper. I feel like we're acting as a bridge, the bridge between the government, the nation and the public. I feel the Vice President's personality is quite gentle, so I try my best to write the characters in a balanced and calm style, so it can comfort people or give people a feeling of encouragement. Temples and schools also ask for tributes to calligraphy from the president to promote the art, which is one of the island's most important cultural assets. Coming up later on Showcase, Unwrapping Tradition. I love designing things that have a story and a history to them, because I find designs like that can, um, they withstand time, it's not a trend. The international fashion industry embraces classical Southern African design. The elbow grease of bees. We'll show you this collection where nature meets cold steel. Spanish Baroque painter Murillo is being rediscovered in London. And the joke's on us as we celebrate the anniversary of one of the greatest comic books ever written. But first, let's take a look at some other stories about culture and the arts from around the world. An early landscape by Dutch painter Vincent van Gogh is on display in Paris ahead of its sale in June. Fishing net menders in the dunes is expected to fetch at least $4 million at auction. It was painted early in the artist's career, but contains what would become trademark elements of his work, like heavy skies as well as crows. The auction will be the first of Van Gogh's work in France in more than 20 years.
A three-day fashion show has kicked off in Karachi, Pakistan, showcasing themes of interfaith harmony and female empowerment. Designers say they want to promote tolerance by using inspiring messages. One piece paired red elements with old world ruffles to represent the power of women, while others took inspiration from religious iconography as well as secular motifs. London's Natural History Museum is celebrating spring with the 10th edition of Sensational Butterflies. Visitors can walk among 60 species of butterflies flying free in a climate-controlled enclosure on the museum's east lawn. The exhibit also displays the stages of the winged insect's life cycle. Working with everything from steel to beeswax, Turkish artist Osman Dinch draws on his own heritage and upbringing to produce works that represent both the natural world and our place in it. Showcase's Kerry Alexandra has his story. Osman Dinch's minimalist approach makes each of his works feel like a single thought lovingly brought into the world. The beautiful simplicity of this exhibition tells a story of human labour and creativity, of the combination of strength and artistry it takes to produce pieces like this. The installation from which the exhibition takes its name encapsulates perfectly the partnership between nature and human intention that runs through Dinch's work. We have a nice Turkish saying, but the English translation of the exhibition is um, bee wax is the elbow grease of the bees. Here you see the hundred uh, aluminium casts and within them you see the resin, the bee wax. So uh, this is an artist, uh, 70 years old, with no assistant, still beating the steel and um, doing his own artwork. Dinch draws heavily on his own background for inspiration. Osman um, comes from um, a farmer family and a, a steelworker family. And he has captured both of his heritage. He's very much connected to the nature and he, he loves material. In nature, everything has roots. And if you see this, these sculptures, you have a surface uh, form and then you have the plinth and then you have the roots of the sculpture. And in the end, uh, the feeling you have is everything is in balance. There's a feeling of both literal balance in the almost mathematical precision of some of the pieces and of a more philosophical balance between nature and industry in the methods and materials used to create each piece. The continuity of the artistic disciplines applied creates an integrity throughout the exhibition. There's something proud in the uncomplicated nature of this collection that feels like echoes of a simpler time and place. A life a million miles from the hustle and bustle of Istanbul. Kerry Alexandra, TRT World, Istanbul. It's a blanket that's become the symbol of a nation. Made of colorfully dyed wool, these traditional coverings are deeply woven into the fabric of the southern African nation of Lesotho. And now they're making their way into the international world of fashion design. Unique, fashionable and one nation's cultural symbol. The South African kingdom of Lesotho's blankets are more than just garments. Legend has it that a British man gifted a Basutu blanket to the ruling king back in the late 19th century, and they've been around ever since. Now young designers who are deeply inspired by the kingdom's legacy are reviving the blankets. I love designing things that have a story and a history to them, because I find designs like that can, um, they withstand time, it's not a trend. Um, and I'm not trying to do trendy fashion, I'm trying to do items that people can invest in and five years from now they can still take out and wear them. Basutu blankets are mostly intricately embroidered colourful woolen garments. Each one of them has its own story. For me to be able to take something of mine um, from my people, from my home, and to be able to wear that with pride and to actually share it with other people as well, it's something that's exciting. It's something that, you know, it makes me want to continue. 
And more than anything, having started the, the Kubo collection, it's also piqued an interest in me to learn more about my own history and more about where the Basutu people come from um, and how Mushrasha put all those clans together. And uh, there's so many stories still to be unpacked, still to be told. And I'm hoping to be able to share those stories through my garments and my creations. Another young designer chose to transform the blankets into jackets and hats in order to make them more practical. Uh, the inspiration beca came because I saw some uh, fashion designers here in Lesotho uh, dealing with um, jackets, making jackets out of uh, Basotho blankets, which are the Santa Marina blankets. Um, so I decided to bring something cool that everybody can wear, whether in, um, in winter, um, summer or daily basis. The people of Lesotho have been wearing a variety of these blankets for more than a hundred years. And with a little help from young designers, the next generations look set to maintain the tradition for a long while to come. Four hundred years after his birth, Spanish Baroque master Murillo is being celebrated in London with a self-portrait exhibition at the National Gallery. Our Nursana Tutar went there to see the painter's lesser-known works of art. London's National Gallery pays homage to one of Spain's forefathers of Baroque painting, Murillo. The artist of the Spanish Golden Age is mostly known for his religious paintings and depictions of street children. But the National Gallery teamed up with New York's Frick Collection to present two of his lesser-known self-portraits. Even after hundreds of years, Murillo is still well-loved throughout the world. The exhibition celebrates the fourth centenary of Murillo's birth. Now, Murillo was born in Seville. His name is very bound up with the city, and uh, the city itself, of course, was very proud of Murillo as one of its most famous sons, even in the 17th century, when the reputation of the city was partly based on the fame of its own painters. So Murillo is very important in defining the identity of uh, Murillo, uh, the identity of Seville as a place uh, where um, painting has a very important uh, role, which is part of the character of the city. The exhibition also presents portraits of Spanish nobility by the master himself. Among paintings of the mighty and powerful sit a child and a couple of giggling young women, showing the many sides of the artist's perspective. There are only 16 identified self-portraits of Murillo. And with the paintings from different stages of his life, the exhibition aims to make people learn more about the painter's personal side. At any self-portrait, you can't help but think about what's happening in the life of the artist at the time he paints it. So the Frick Collection self-portrait dates from the 1650s. Murillo shows himself in his 30s. He is successful by then, but he presents himself as a gentleman, you know, in a sort of monument or memorializing way. Um, and by the time he paints the self-portrait in the National Gallery, about 10, 15 years later, he's in his 50s, he's lost his wife, he's lost five of his nine children. You can't help but read there's a sort of weariness in his look, but he presents himself very much as the successful painter. He's surrounded by the painter's attributes. He looks very relaxed, but he's also quite self-assured. And we know from an inscription on the painting that he painted it to fulfill the wishes and prayers of his children. So it's obviously meant to be read as quite a private family image, and yet there's something also um, quite lasting about it. Until the end of May, Murillo de Self Portraits exhibition will keep shedding a light on the Spanish master's unknown site, on the moody walls of the National Gallery. Nur Senatter, TRT World, London. We've come to the end of another episode here on Showcase. Head to our YouTube channel for more from the world of arts and culture. Today we'll leave you with a look back at what some people say is one of the greatest comic books ever written, which also gave us the backstory about one of the greatest villains ever created. I'm Efnan Han. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.